so yeah, I'm gonna talk a bit about open source. Uh, I'll preface this with, um, this might be a radical departure for some people from what they're used to uh, in terms of like thoughts about what we do as developers. Uh, so if there are a couple of jarring ideas as we go along here, just bear with me. Uh, quickly about myself, my name's Chris Vanderwater. Um, I am an Oklahoma native. I've lived here pretty much my whole life. Uh, I am a contributor to a open source project called Drupal. I've contributed to versions six, seven, and eight, most heavily to eight, uh, which is the most recent version. Uh, I'm a co-maintainer of the most widely used Drupal add-on, which is a, a module called C Tools. Uh, and I specialize largely in page layout, though I do lots of other fun and interesting things as well. Uh, also, I'm the uh, Drupal 8 plugin subsystem co-author, and I'm a senior software engineer at Acquia. Acquia is a Boston-based business uh, who focuses uh, almost exclusively on the, uh, the Drupal uh, uh, um, software platform, and we do a lot of Fortune 100 level websites, uh, things in government, things in business, all sorts of stuff in that arena. Um, so, now I've talked a lot about Drupal. Uh, you may have no idea what that is, so for the record, Drupal is an open source content management system. Uh, it's been around for I think the better part of the last 17 or 18 years now, uh, so it's, it's quite old. Um, it is GPL2 plus, and we can talk about licenses maybe later in the Q&A section if anybody wants to. Uh, it runs about 2% of the web, which is to say it's big. It runs a lot of websites. Um, of those, dozens of the Fortune 500 are actually um, on Drupal. Uh, it has an enormous community. Uh, in fact, we like to say that Drupal is the largest open source project. It's hard to kind of nail specifics down because we measure very differently than a lot of other projects do. Um, but we certainly have the largest contributor base in terms of people who actually get involved uh, in any given patch uh, or git commit that we apply to the system. Um, it's literally in the tens of thousands. And we also have tens of thousands of add-ons to Drupal itself, um, which is to say that there are a lot of people who've tread a lot of ground already uh, so that you don't have to. In life, the luckiest people in the world are those driven by the desire to be part of something great. When you work in open source, you'll be surrounded by people like these. This is a quote by Dries Beitart. Uh, this is the man who actually created Drupal. Um, he is our quote unquote benevolent dictator for life and uh, he also happened to found the company I work for. So what is open source? Uh, who here has actually ever contributed to any open source? Anything? A little bit? Cool. Um, so for a quick definition, uh, I went to Google and Google says that open source is denoting software for which the original source code is made freely available and may be redistributed and modified. This is technically accurate, um, although there are some nuances to that definition. Uh, I like to explain it in more of layman's terms. And when I do this, I like to use cooking because everyone has to eat, right? So when you cook, uh, you probably have a recipe uh, this is a recipe for a Thai green curry. And, um, you know, a lot of people like recipes just the way they are, but maybe you're not into mushrooms, right? Maybe you want to swap it out for something else. Maybe put some nice red bell peppers in there instead. And who knows, mix it up a little bit and toss some basil into this concoction. And just like that, you've taken what was open source, you knew all of the components that went into it, you swapped portions of it out, and you made it your own. And this is kind of an idea of how open source can and does work. Um, so conceptually, open source software is pretty simple, but emotionally it's pretty complicated because as developers, we get paid to code. So when suddenly you take what you were paid to build and you start giving it away, this gives a lot of people pause. Many people went to school. Maybe they are still paying that off. 
had to go through the process of doing internships, get some real work experience under their belt, go through promotions, specializations, and ultimately, everybody wants some degree of job security, right? And it can feel as though you don't have that when you start giving away what, what you've actually worked on and built. A lot of us have worked in proprietary software, helped build platforms for you know, the people we work for, uh, or built software as a service platforms. Uh, usually it involves helping others build some sort of residual income. That is, by and large, what developers do today. Right? We build it once so that we can have an income ongoing. Typical process might be that you work for a company, you build something for that company, something specific to them, and then you have to build a team that specializes in that thing, right? Then you have to scale the product once you start actually getting some customers in the front door, and hopefully if you did it right, you make a little money in the process. But how many people are on your team? One, 10, 100, 1,000? Most companies can't afford to put 1,000 people onto a single team. Uh, it's just not tenable. Anybody know a guy named Linus Torvalds? He built Linux, and uh, it is probably the most successful open source project in the world. He says, in open source, we feel strongly that to really do something well, you have to get a lot of people involved. That's hard to do when you're at a company. A lot of people, like, what is that? Well, it depends upon the scale of your product. It depends on what you're building. Four or five people might be too many for a project. But once you get to a certain scale, this starts to matter. Like, how big is the thing we're building? What are we maintaining? I suspect some people have some familiarity with Windows. I'm specifically going to talk about 3.1. 3.1 started uh, as Dave Cutler and about seven or eight of his key developers moving from DEC to Microsoft, and, and they began to build uh, what was then known as NT 3.1. Uh, it grew to several hundred people for that first version that shipped in 1993, and today Microsoft employs about 5,000 people for the Windows team. That includes developers, testers, program managers, and architects. Um, I picked this information up off this Ars Technica forum link, and I'd be happy to hand it out to anybody. Uh, but they specifically referenced a book called Showstoppers, which specifically tells this story um, for anybody who might want some more information. Uh, my point being, at the scale of Microsoft, a product like Windows starts out in the single digits, then moves quickly into triple digits, and ultimately the maintenance on it is 5,000 people going forward, maintenance and continuous development. That's a bunch of people. Most companies don't have what it, what it takes to build a team like that. So here's my corporate litmus test, right? When you're looking at your own work and what you're doing, you should really have a, a very good view of the size of your development team. How many people are gonna be involved in this project? And not just now, but in the long term too. What does this thing turn into, right? What does it become in five, 10 years worth of additional development? How many people will be required? What, what is the scope of that team's mandate for building the project? What will it take to maintain the product going forward? And uh, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about PHP especially, uh, there's some forward-facing site involved in the process, right? We, we oftentimes have something that the world sees. And so you know, a lot of times we see companies build a product to maintain a site. Well, now they're maintaining a product and a site, right? Both? Yeah. And then there's always the question of bus factor. Do, is that like specific to my little corner of the world? Does anybody else use that term? Bus factor is uh, like if the lead developer got hit by a bus today, what would happen to the product, right? Who continues to maintain and help push this thing forward? Does the company fall apart? Do you need key man insurance, right? These are important questions that you have to have answers to. 
So my question is, what is the minimum your team must own in order to do their job, right? Bill Gates, suspect we've heard of him. Certainly there's a phenomenon around open source. You know free software will be a vibrant area. There will be a lot of neat things that get done there. Um, Microsoft was not known as the most open company in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, in, in fact, they received a ton of criticism for a lot of their business practices and things that, uh, that happened during that time period. Uh, these days, you can really tell Microsoft has started to embrace open source. This is their um, open source projects list. Uh, and you might not be able to see that number, but this is the first 10 of 784 projects, right? So Microsoft has given away a lot of code these days. Anybody want to guess who that is? That's Google. And I stopped scrolling after four pages and stitched it together. There are easily another thousand projects that they have given away that I decided not to even try to get into the list, right? So uh, I actually couldn't get a good count on theirs because they just said, oh, star matched many of thousands. And I said, okay, cool story. Um, Amazon. Amazon's an enormous company. They have 1,387 different open source projects out there that they maintain and make freely available for everyone, right? Uh, and there are many, many more. Twitter maintains an enormous amount of open source code. Um, yeah, all sorts of different people. So if open source is good enough for Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, why isn't it good enough for your business and what you do? Sometimes we're doing something very specialized and we need to build our own thing. Sometimes we need extra resources maintaining the thing which we have built. And it can be hard to always hire for those. So it's worth considering what open sourcing a project might look like. Uh, anybody in here who'd heard of Bruce Perrins? He's one of like the, the old school Linux guys helped get um, like the open source definitions in place for what this stuff looked like and, and what the um, like ethics of it were. Um, has a lot of really good thoughts on this stuff. And he says the strategic marketing paradigm of open source is massively parallel drunkards walk filtered by a Darwinistic process. Now that's a really complicated way to say, um, Let's see, there's another similar quote, something about monkeys typing on typewriters until you get Shakespeare. This is the same sort of idea, except that we actually have a filtering process in place where we can take the best ideas and we can incorporate them more quickly. And maybe there are two different groups of ideas that got developed parallel, and we can mix and match these things together to make a better product than what one or two developers might have done on their own instead of having, you know, dozens of developers collaborate to build a single feature. Anybody in here ever gone rock climbing? Uh, so rock climbing is a sport I recently took up and it's a really enjoyable uh, sport if you've never done it. Uh, but one of the things that you learn as you begin to climb walls is that when you climb it alone, you figure it out more slowly. But if you have someone else who's climbing it with you, then you can trade ideas and you can get through the problem more quickly. They literally call um, what's called a bouldering problem, right? Uh, and so you are looking for a solution. And so this is, this is a, a really interesting sort of real world example of uh, two heads are better than one, right? And open source operates exclusively off of this idea. So, the open source value proposition, uh, number one, is that we have thousands of contributors just immediately. Your team expanded 10 or 100 fold probably. We can fail quickly and cheaply. Again, this idea of like, I get on the wall, I grab a handhold and then realize it's a foothold, right? Like maybe that's not what you should be doing. Let's try something else. Uh, we don't invest heavily in 
ideas that are ultimately going to fail. At least we usually don't invest heavily in ideas that are going to fail. Uh, we like to turn things around very quickly, very cheaply, figure out whether or not they're going to succeed or fail, and then uh, move forward with them. A uh, practical example of this, using Drupal as, as um, my, my example, uh, Drupal maintains a core product that anyone can go download, use today. And over the course of the last five to six years, we've really changed our deployment process and how we do that. And so one of the things that we've done here in the last couple of years is we've implemented what we call an experimental module process. Uh, so the core system ships with a whole bunch of supported stuff, but we're also shipping with things that are explicitly unsupported so that people can play with them and give us feedback as to what's working and what's not. And we have the ability to change those things completely at any time until we mark them stable or we reject them from the code base completely and we, we pull them out. And so this is a really cool way to kind of get in and uh, begin showing people where we want to go without making promises we can't keep and without giving anybody uh, something that we can't maintain. One of the biggest values of open source for me is that there's always someone to learn from. There's always someone who knows more than you do about a topic. In, in a large enough community, you're never the smartest person in the room. You know, and, and what's, the, uh, what's the saying about that? If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Generally speaking, there's a passion far beyond what you're likely to find in your regular workplace. There are people who are doing this in their free time. There are people who spend nights and weekends doing this. There are people who want nothing more than to fix a problem that they have run into a hundred or a thousand times. And they'd like to see no one else ever have to deal with that problem again. And these are the sorts of things that you might also have in your own projects at work, but which you don't have the time to actually allocate to fixing. They're bugs you live with and deal with because they aren't in like that, that critical, what does our product do sort of pathway. Open source also provides opportunities and connections beyond your job. It exposes you to people who might mean something to your future, or they might mean something to your team's future, right? These might be people who turn around and see what you're doing and ultimately want to invest in your company or want to invest in individuals doing things there. So in summary, uh, open source is good enough for the biggest global players in the world. Open source can reduce the maintenance burden on smaller teams, and it can radically accelerate their velocity by focusing them exclusively on their minimum viable product. And open source provides opportunities for individual growth. On a personal note, I've spent the last 14 years working exclusively in Drupal. That's a long time to be involved in any project, much less an open source project. Um, I'm certainly one of a handful of the like longest active members of that community. Um, for myself, I've had endless opportunities to improve myself and to contribute more to the project. Uh, I've had lots of exposure to both other PHP and some non-PHP projects through that, that time over the course of the last six or seven years. Uh, Drupal has completely reinvented itself and we virtually rewrote the product from scratch uh, with a focus on Composer and using Symfony and uh, bringing in all of these kinds of ideas uh, for uh, reusable components that were outside of Drupal so that we could play nice with everyone else. And I'm a member of a community who genuinely cares. I have friends in this community who I will likely keep in touch with for the rest of my life, whether I continue to do Drupal or not. And that also, I think, just personally, is a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, so with that, uh, I want to just open it up for some question time. Uh, that's all I have from a slides perspective. Uh, but there's a lot of, of information kind of in this. And there are a lot of other topics that we could cover. I mentioned licenses earlier and things like that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to open it up to questions. And I'll repeat questions so that people online can hear what 
was said. So if, if there are any, and if they're not, that's fine too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so. Go. How do you handle any external Yeah, so that's a, uh, so the question was, what sort of external dependencies does Drupal have and how do we manage uh, like updating those dependencies? Uh, and there's a very, <laughs> that is a very big question. Uh, so I'll give the smallest answer that I can. Um, first, we use Composer to manage all of our dependencies. Um, so, uh, and we do depend on a really significant portion of the Symfony stack. Uh, there are other things like Guzzle, and um, I think we have a couple of things that we depend on out of Zend Framework. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, but everything that we do depend on has to be compatible with GPL2, because we're a GPL2 project. Um, so, for example, we can include MIT code into our project, but the opposite cannot happen. Like, they can't include code from us if they're an MIT licensed project. Um, so, with that being said, uh, we have an entire team whose job is to uh, really keep track of what's going on, especially from a security perspective within Drupal. And so we will update dependencies uh, for a few reasons. The most important reason is when there's a, a security situation involved. Um, so when that comes along, um, we will figure out what's necessary in order to, to do that upgrade, whether or not it has any sort of breaking issues for us. And if it does have breaking issues, like from a backward compatibility perspective for us, then there's a whole other set of things that we have to go into and consider. But by and large, most of the packages we depend on are some of the bigger packages that are maintained pretty well, and we very seldom have that problem. So usually it's just a matter of doing the update and doing a, a new release for ourselves internally. Um, we do this all via uh, semantic versioning, so, for example, the newest version of Drupal, which will come out tomorrow, is 8.6.0. And then, like, any sort of bugs or security issues that we need to take care of going forward would be 8.6.1, 8.6.2. Uh, but if we had, like, a version bump from Symfony 3 to Symfony 4 on something like that, um, technically, from a semantic versioning perspective, we should hold off until, say, 8.7 to do that, and then we want to include those things in. Um, sometimes, depending upon the issue, we may break Simver for, for an iteration uh, in order to, again, take care of either major security issues or major bugs. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, so from a testing perspective, uh, so the question was, what do we do from a testing perspective? Let's take that question, and then we'll come back to the other one. Um, so Drupal has an enormous testing library. Uh, so we embraced simple test, I want to say, 10 years ago now. And uh, by embraced, I mean we embraced it spiritually and then rewrote it internally, because that's what we did back in those days. But um, so we still have a lot of, of testing that kind of bears some resemblance to that, but I mean, it's tens of thousands of functional tests that we, we actually have um, that do things like test the UI to make sure that it works the way that we want it to. We even have JavaScript testing in place these days, and increasingly we've introduced as much unit test coverage as we possibly can, but of course, you know, uh, we've probably all seen like the, the drawers that open and hit each other, and it's like 100% unit test coverage, but no functional coverage, right? And so we have both. We have uh, an enormous amount of both. Uh, Drupal.org itself is actually set up so that any patches coming into the core issue queue will actually spin up and run an entire uh, test suite against that patch and then give errors if there are any. So we know whether or not we've, uh, whether or not we've broken the system before we ever commit anything. 
And so oftentimes, if it's new features, that means that we have gates to getting, uh, getting patches committed. So like there's a testing gate, and if you've introduced new features, you have to have test coverage. It's just kind of pure, plain, and simple. If you don't have test coverage, then your patch is gonna sit in the issue queue and languish until you or someone else build test coverage for it. And then you have to get reviewers back in and looking at it and saying like, yeah, this looks good. So even if you have 100% test coverage on something and it's all passing, um, you still have to build that consensus in order to get something committed and into the code base. What was the, the second question? Um, yeah, so I'm going to get this wrong, but the spirit of it will be correct. Uh, so what Drupal does for this is we will actually do uh, two releases oftentimes when we might have done one. So for example, if there were security fixes and we had stuff that were feature additions that were already in like head, then we might actually rebase the feature additions out and do a release that's just a security release and a release that's a security release plus new features if we had them ready to go. So that someone can come in and they can say, uh, I don't wanna deal with that because that might have implications, I just wanna deal with this. Also, depending upon the severity of the security issue and whether it was our security issue or not or whether it was someone else's, occasionally, occasionally, we'll provide patches so that you can just apply a patch to fix the security issue and move on with life. That is not common for us because like, we'd prefer someone have to work for it to figure out what was changed uh, because oftentimes if you can look at the patch then you can understand how to exploit it and so Usually it's a little obfuscated, but frankly, you can dig through the git commit history and figure out what the patch was very quickly too. So, you know, it, it's, it, that's on our security team and they make those decisions. Uh, but the release team does oftentimes do a security release and a security plus release uh, simultaneously. So yes, that's a thing. Cool. GPL. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so let me preface this with uh, the the question was uh, around licensing and which I would prefer. Uh, so let me preface it with a, a couple quick things. Um, one, uh, this is my opinion. Two, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> And you really need to be one to understand all the nuance that's there. Uh, but MIT is pretty much like what, the, what I had thrown up as a definition, was just like, hey, the source is out there, and you can use it. Uh, that includes commercially. Like a lot of times, uh, commercial entities might just take uh, something that's uh, MIT licensed, and they could incorporate it in the product they're selling, and they don't really have to do anything except provide attribution. Um, so like from that perspective, a lot of companies will tell you they're really interested in MIT, and a lot of developers will tell you that they're interested in M MIT as well. Uh, I've spent 14 years working with a GPL license, and what GPL means is I can request it from anybody who might be distributing it, which means I can tell that the code does what they say it does. Right? There's no farming it out to some other third party system in there that's gonna take all my data and sell it to someone. Like I can find those things out in a GPL license. I can't find that out in a lot of the other open source licenses. So for me, I go GPL on things, but every developer has kind of a different take on this topic. So you can say you open source My understanding is you wouldn't have to. You can't really close source it, but you could make changes to it and no one can request that back from you. Uh, but it's with, with attribution though, you have to say, hey, I, I took this and I'm using it. 
Uh, so case in point, um, there were many years ago, I think it was XP, where people started saying, oh, Microsoft is using this TCP IP handler. And they knew that because there was a flaw in it, not that they could exploit, but there was like a known bug that it responded a very particular way to things. And so people knew virtually immediately that Microsoft had included that into their code base. And that was totally kosher and it was okay for them to do, but it was originally an open source license thing that they included and, and used. Um, you held up a sign earlier and I don't know what that means. Oh. I don't have my glasses on, so yeah. Cool, all right, any other questions? Should I repeat that question? <laughs> Um, so, uh, you're asking probably the most biased person in the world, yeah, right? Okay. So, we'll, we'll say that up front. Uh, right. So, let me repeat the question. Uh, is there any time I wouldn't use Drupal as my starting point? Uh, and so, again, full disclosure, I'm probably the most biased person in the world, but the answer to that is yes. Uh, and that's specifically when PHP would be bad for the solution in the first place. So, case in point, um, if I needed to build like a really exceptionally high performance uh, routing based utility like that, that's just taking API requests in and processing them. Uh, Drupal has facilities to do like really great API processing. And we have probably the best um, caching engine of any open source project on the web, uh, or at least any open source PHP project. Um, so like we can respond very, very quickly once we know what responses are gonna look like for various uh, cache mechanisms. But you know, if you have something that's processing an enormous amount of data and needs to be very, very quick, you should probably be looking at something like Go or Python or, or something like that in order to really do that. So I wouldn't use it when PHP is, a, is not necessarily a great solution in the first place. Um, are there other times I wouldn't use it? I don't know. Uh, Drupal's really good as like an application definition sort of thing. Uh, we have a whole abstraction where you can just go in and you can say like, oh, I need objects that look this way and we can build all the database abstraction for that. We can, we can do everything so that you just deal with this one object. But a lot of people have that, so the other time I wouldn't use it is if I'm not super familiar with it yet. If you wanted to become familiar with it, it's a great product, it's really, really capable, um, but you know, there's definitely a learning curve. The Drupal community has a, a long-standing joke about our learning curve and, and it like goes up like this and then it gets really steep and then it turns backwards and there's like a, a little stick man hanging off the end of it. Um, but then it plateaus out because like once you've really learned how to use the system, you can do an enormous amount with it. Like just a RESTful API? Yeah, a lot of people are starting to do stuff like that. I, I'm starting to, have been for years at this point. So Drupal core during the 8x release really focused in on trying to make APIs something that it would do out of the box. Uh, so we have a, a whole system for doing RESTful APIs out of the box. Uh, if you're wanting to do something like GraphQL or something like that, then uh, there are modules to do those sorts of things. Uh, and 
Drupal's actually a really natural fit to the way GraphQL thinks. So for, for my money, I suspect that that will become a really significant thing in the long term for us. Um, but it's still kind of early days around GraphQL. REST, we've been doing for a really long time. We understand it pretty well. And we've got good abstractions in place for helping to make that stuff happen. Um, so again, I had mentioned our, uh, our entity abstraction layer. Uh, it has good handling out of the box for doing uh, RESTful services to custom defined entities. Um, so for example, there's an entire commerce platform built in Drupal and we can do uh, RESTful services on top of commerce and build a headless commerce application that does like, you know, product inventory management or these sorts of things. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, Drupal definitely can and does do stuff like that on the regular. Great, uh, well, I think I'm gonna call it a, a few minutes early, and uh, yeah, if y'all have any questions, I'm Eclipse GC, uh, I hang out in the Techlahoma channels these days, I'm specifically in the PHP and the Drupal channel, and uh, yeah, feel free to ping me, thanks.